All right. Welcome everyone to my session, How the Rules of Improv Comedy Can Help Improve Your Business. My name is Darren Gazinski, the Director of Culture and Engagement at the NCEO. Uh, I am so excited to do this session virtually, though I would love to be doing it in person uh, like I have been for the last uh, four years or so. I did this session for the first time four years ago in Minneapolis, where we should be uh, this week. Uh, but given the circumstances, uh, we're really, really happy uh, to be able to uh, pivot and uh, adjust to uh, something that's unprecedented, um, but, you know, continue to provide you guys with content and, and uh, bring the community together in a, in a virtual uh, sense. Um, as if you've ever been to this session, you know that it's, um, it's full of uh, interaction with one another and we play a lot of fun games. Uh, but, you know, I had to do some improvising myself. Uh, so you're going to see a different version of this. You're going to see me illustrate uh, what I would normally have you do in person. I'm happy to have uh, one of my best friends and, and colleagues here at the NCEO uh, joining us later. Uh, so uh, thanks to him, you're going you're gonna to see some of these exercises played out in front of you, and we'll have you do some, uh, do some reflections on, on what that stuff looks like. Okay, all right, so uh, before we get started, uh, please remember that if you're looking for CE credit, you must finish up uh, those quizzes before the session is over, uh, and if you have if you have any questions, you can feel free to let me know during the session. I'll be answering those periodically. Also, we do ask that at the end of the session, you fill out uh, our session survey. Okay, so I just want to get started with how and what to communicate in times of uncertainty. Uh, this, this session will largely focus uh, more on the how. Uh, it's the manner in which we communicate that can be extremely important when it comes to helping people feel less anxiety or stress and less uncertainty when it comes to uh, how leaders and our colleagues are going to respond uh, to one another. Uh, so, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. In terms of what to communicate, I think we're always, we're always looking for communication that is uh, transparent, truthful, um, it's, it's empathy focused. That means you got to listen just as much as you communicate. You know, it's got to be two-way communication. You got to listen uh, just as much as you're trying to convey information uh, and authentic, but make sure that authenticity and empathy are one and the same. Okay. Now a little later, we're going to be talking about um, uh, some of the ways and some of the things that might jeopardize trust in an organization. And a lot of times, uh, those, those things revolve around fear, right? Fear of the unknown, fear that you're not, you're kind of being led astray. Um, uh, you know, fear can be a huge impediment, uh, especially in this unfamiliar virtual environment. So building trust in, in this unfamiliar setting is, is going to be critical. Uh, to how your team responds coming out of this unprecedented moment, right? Uh, so we're really going to focus heavily today on how we respond to adversity and how we respond to one another, as opposed to just what we're responding to, okay? So right now, if you could, um, please, in the chat box, I want you to share... Uh, a few things with me. We're going to have a conversation about uh, circumstances or experiences in your life where you felt more or less fear. Okay. Uh, so that means that what I want you to type is, is a circumstance uh, or situation where you felt uh, more fearful when it came to making mistakes, uh, when it came to being acknowledged whether it be in the workplace or outside of the workplace, okay? You can focus on social settings. Where do you feel more fear, okay? And at the same time, let me know where you feel less fear when it comes to making mistakes or 
feeling or as though you're going to be judged uh, as opposed to uh, acknowledged and heard, right? Uh, so more fear, less fear. Go ahead and type those in the chat box and we're gonna get to those a little bit later. So let's dive in. Improv for business is kind of a wacky topic um, uh, because typically improv comedy is not always um, paired with, it's not always associated with business, right? So what are, what are we talking about first and foremost? What is, uh, what is improv comedy? Most people, when I ask what is improv comedy, um, they tend to bring up whose line is it, is it anyway? Uh, they tend to bring up Saturday Night Live, things like that. Some people have been to a show. Some people have actually practiced improv comedy in their life and, and uh, shared their experience as being super helpful, right? So, you know, when I think of improv comedy, the first thing that comes to mind are those kind of seminal actors and, and, and all of their seminal characters in Saturday Night Live. Many of the people that came... Uh, through Saturday Night Live in the early days and, and even recently got their start in improv. Okay, M many of them actually started in, in the sort of world famous nas nationally renowned uh, improv comedy school, Second City up in Chicago. Uh, one of the inspirations uh, for this talk was act one of those actors. It's actually Tina Fey. Uh, here are some of my favorites. Tina Fey is certainly a favorite. I got the inspiration uh, for, for this uh, session while I was uh, reading an excerpt from her book, actually. And in that book, she sort of describes the rules of improv comedy, but not just how they sort of play out on stage and why they're important on stage, uh, but she kind of discusses how they might play out in life. And I think for me, improv comedy has varied applications, uh, both on stage, in life, and in business, like we're going to uh, get into today, right? So why improv? Well, improv is constant adaptation and creation, first and foremost, all right? We are adapting to something that none of us could have predicted. Everyone is trying to be agile during these times. They're trying to figure out um, uh, how to navigate, okay? Uh, so agility is especially important, right? But it's not so clear how we do that. So we can be responsive, but sometimes we need to uh, give ourselves some structure, okay? Give ourselves some, uh, some way uh, to rethink, uh, uh, you know, rethink our next moves. Um, and especially as a team, when we're working in a team, uh, those norms become especially important. Everything is uncertain uh, on, on an, in an improv uh, sketch, right? People don't know what's coming next. So radical trust with your team members becomes absolutely critical uh, to the success, the overall success of the team and whether or not the, the skit even plays out as something that might be considered funny, okay? Uh, so the same applies, the same is true for, for business. Right now, we're dealing with something uncertain and we need to come together and we need to practice radical trust and effective communication with one another to collectively deal with some of the problems that we're faced with, right? We were creating nothing from something every single day. Well, something from nothing every single day, excuse me. Uh, so whether that be in work, in life, improv, practicing improv can have positive effects in terms of how we apply it uh, to create more trust with those that we work with, with those that we know and love, and even in settings where we're with entire strangers, right? And this is what I mean about empathy, right? We need to listen to people. And you can't effectively do improv, whether it be uh, on a stage or applied to a business or in a workplace. You can't effectively do that without listening to your partner. Uh, and we need to listen to our people right now more, more than ever. We need to listen to their fears, their concerns, uh, and we need to be open and honest with one another. We need to be able to have difficult conversations. So some of these norms are going to help us do that. So how does improv improve how we do business and culture? 
Okay, well, let's look at how, uh, how improv might, you know, uh, help us with some of these areas. One, first and foremost, coping with adversity. Again, this is what we're dealing with right now. Uh, we don't know uh, week to week what the following week might bring us. We don't even know uh, that this will be over by end year. Even if things ease up, uh, you know, there's, there's a chance that, that we're, we're confronted with other dilemmas related to COVID-19 in the future, right? So coping with, adversity, coping with adversity improv allows us to be agile, all right? But even in the day-to-day -day operations of the business, when you're problem solving, when you're trying to find solutions to problems, uh, these are all, uh, you know, improv can be really, really effective at doing these things as a team uh, and doing them efficiently, right? Making improvements, building on one another's ideas, sharing ideas first and foremost we need to feel comfortable sharing those ideas first and foremost right creating better relationships with the people that we're working with okay so communications employee relations innovation brainstorm but at the end of the day teamwork is is absolutely critical so just as on an improv stage we need to trust our team and we need to be able uh, to work together effectively uh, to come up uh, with a solution to our problems or uh, to even diversify what we're already doing. Should, should uh, things get better, these applications uh, will still prove uh, to be positive in a team environment. So remember that uh, when we're talking about improv, uh, we're going to apply it to our everyday interactions, okay? And we're gonna demonstrate how to do some of that stuff in a little bit. All right, so uh, one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite uh, researchers of all time works at uh, the Harvard Business School currently. Her name is Amy Edmondson, okay? Now, if you don't follow Amy Edmondson on Twitter, or if you have a Twitter, be sure to follow Amy Edmondson on Twitter, right? Because she talks about a concept that, we're, that is critically important in the workplace uh, and improv is going to help us create more of it it's called psychological safety right that coin was turned a while ago okay now amy edmondson was doing research she had some seminal research done in 1999 and early 2000s okay where she found in her research that the two most important traits of effective teams uh, were high involvement and psychological safety. Now, if you've been to any, any of the, you know, open book management sessions this week, um, or the high involvement planning, strategic planning, we've heard a lot of a talk about high involvement and the importance of getting people involved in that strategic planning, right, and ideation, okay? Uh, and that, cre that requires a lot of structure. Uh, now, what we're going to talk about is psych psychological safety, and there's some barriers. There's some barriers to high involvement, right? Structure is one of them, okay? Uh, so I encourage you to, one, look up Amy Edmondson. Follow her on Twitter. Look up some of her research and writing. Um, it's great stuff. She's one of my favorites, all right? So what are the barriers to creating high involvement and psychological safety? Well, high involvement oftentimes uh, is... The biggest barrier is a lack of structure. People don't know where to get involved. They don't know how, they don't know when, they don't know what their focus is, right? You know, you can say you have an open door policy, but an open door policy is nothing if, pe is, is worth nothing if people don't walk through it, walk through that door, right? So it's important to structure that open door. You can't just give people permission to be involved. Right? You need to structure it, right? Make it an expectation and show people you got to lead. You have to lead with stewardship. You have to create a structure, a time, a place, a focus, right? Who's going to be involved? What are they involved in? Maybe some teams are involved in, in certain things and others uh, in, in you know, something that pertains to their work, right? Now, what is often the biggest barrier to psychological safety um, that is fear. It's that fear of involvement. What are people going to think of me? 
Um, are they going to judge me uh, if I say something uh, that, that, you know, maybe is a little wacky or maybe is not fully formed. It's not a fully formed idea. Maybe it's an uninformed idea and somebody, you, you just, you need to feel comfortable uh, saying, I had this idea, but I don't really know how to flesh it out. Well, the best way to do that is, is by harnessing the, the uh, strengths of your other team members, right? Everyone has their strengths and er everyone has their weaknesses. Uh, weaknesses aren't a bad thing, they're inevitable. We all have weaknesses, right? But we need to feel comfortable with sharing that something is our weakness. We also need to be self-aware of our strengths. Right, so improv creates norms and structures where judgment is postponed. All right, we're putting it, we're putting it off till later, especially when it comes to ideas. We're not going to judge people on their ideas, but we may judge ideas. But there's a time and place for that. Okay, participation thrives in improv. It combats fear. All right, uh, by creating more affirmation among a team more openness, and more support. At the end of the day, right now, we need to come together and we need to support one another. We need to create opportunities uh, to make our relationships thrive, to, uh, to really take advantage and leverage the ideas of the crowd, okay? Uh, so improv can help us with that, all right? So, we're going to get in to some of your comments. Okay. Now I'm going to read through some of these. Um, most fear. Okay. Let's go. Let's start there. When have you felt the most fear when it comes to expressing yourself openly, failure, making mistakes or feeling acknowledged or accepted, right? Um, the good one here when you're not in control, when you feel a lack of control, and a lot of people do feel a lack of control, especially with regard to where their company is going, right? That's why high involvement is, is so important. Um, let's see, most fear. Keeping my family calm and my mother in good spirits while she recovers from COVID. First and foremost, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, that's, that is a very tough situation, right? Uh, but oftentimes, it's family that really can make somebody feel less fear, right? And I imagine uh, that if your mom were to answer this question, when do you feel when do you feel less fear? You know, she's probably feeling a tremendous amount of fear right now. But it is family at times that can make you feel less fear. Oftentimes, I feel the least amount of fear at the dinner table. Right when you're around your friends, you feel that support, that love. Okay, um, most fear groups of unknown people. Now this is this is so common. Um, I mean, how many of you have have been to a gathering or a party uh, where you were in, you were invited by one person uh, to their extended you know friend group, and you know absolutely nobody here. You don't know what kind of personalities or traits you're gonna run into. You don't know uh, whether or not you're gonna be judged. Maybe you say, maybe you express um, uh, something politically, right? That might be, uh, that might, might not be welcome. Or maybe your sense of humor doesn't quite match up, right? So we have this, we have this tendency to kind of, uh, sh kind of put a barrier around us to protect us from this fear and it doesn't allow us to express our true selves when we're uh, when we're around groups of unknown people it's hard to be authentic and and i would encourage you not to be authentic if you're a total jerk <laughs> you know I, again like i said yesterday in my session uh, authenticity is only as good as your empathy Right, you need it. You need to be able to be authentic, but to show somebody that whoever they are, you're not going to judge them for who they are. Right? Uh, let me see if we have any others. Uh, when you don't know others, that's another good one. Um, all right. When you when you experience financial fear, 
right? And this is something that is, is happening right now. A lot of people are experiencing financial fear. Am I going to be laid off? Am I not going to be laid off? We heard a story um, earlier this week from a company uh, whose, whose leadership and management teams uh, took pay cuts, right, to prevent potential furloughs or layoffs, right? That's, that goes a long way to creating a sense of trust. And maybe you feel less financial fear when you see people acknowledging the potential side, side effects of, of uh, this, this bizarre downturn and this unprecedented crisis, right? So we got some really good ones here. Uh, and so thanks to those of you that contributed. I often say that whenever, uh, whenever I have to meet a, a girlfriend's parents for the first time, that's, that's when I tend to, <laughs> I tend to feel a, a, a lot of fear in that moment, right? Because you know you're being judged. So you gotta be on your best behavior. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta watch what you say and you gotta say, you gotta say, you know, you have to express yourself authentically uh, knowing that you're going to be judged, right? Uh, so we've all been in that situation. It's nerve wracking. And I'm sure there are a ton of others um, that, that we could get into. But let's get into when we feel less fear, the least amount of fear when it comes to expressing yourself openly uh, or failing, making mistakes. Now, somebody said, when I'm working, you feel less fear when you're working. Well, I, I feel fortunate to still have a job right now because I've got a lot of friends uh, that have lost their jobs. A lot of friends here in the Oakland area um, many work in the service industry. And as you know, uh, the, numbers, the number of, of um, unemployment filings uh, has reached unprecedented highs, okay? I mean, just in the first three weeks, there were more than 17 million people, just in three weeks. Um, that's, that's insane. And that can create a real sense of fear. So I bet a lot of us that are working, that feel privileged to be able to say work from home or you know, still get a paycheck, we feel a little less fear than you know, many of our friends might that have unfortunately uh, lost, lost their jobs. They feel a lack of, a lack of control. Right? And we got another one here that says, uh, when you're one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes big groups can be extremely stressful, right? But who you're one-on-one -on -one with really matters. If you're one-on-one -on -one with your boss, it really depends on who you're, how your boss behaves, right? If you're one-on-one -on -one with a friend or a colleague, somebody that you have a lot of faith and trust in, maybe been there before you during hard times, uh, that, that can uh, make for less fear. So that's a good one. Um, let me look at some more here. When you're in control of a situation, right? Or let's say, let's say you're an expert. Let's say you really kind of know, um, you know what you're about to do. You feel comfortable. You feel in control, right? You feel like your, your practice or the work that you've done to this point um, enables you to feel more comfortable with, with, situations that might be uncomfortable for others, okay? Uh, let's see. Now, when we have financial stability, right? So this gets back to, to that. And, and I think that a lot of times uh, when, we, when I ask audiences these questions, they really tend to focus on their friendships. They focus on the friendships that make them feel comfortable and safe, right? With your closest friends. You know, now where I come from, my closest friends, we call them chosen family. It's just like our family. I feel very comfortable with my, with my family, uh, you know, being myself and expressing some ideas or thoughts, uh, maybe making mistakes. I mean, I've probably made more mistakes around my, my dad than anybody on, on planet earth, right? But he still loves me. Okay, uh, so, so I think friendships are especially important. And, for, and our friendships in the workplace, research shows, uh, are of critical importance. 
uh, people are more likely to leave a job where they don't feel like they have a personal connection to at least one person in their workplace. Okay, so now imagine, imagine if we had multiple positive connections. Imagine if we could call our colleagues friends. Okay, that's, that's something very powerful. Uh, and it makes, it makes people far more interested in solving problems rather than leaving because of them. Okay, so these are really, these are really, really excellent. I, I love some of your contributions here and I appreciate um, your candidness when it comes to, to some of these things. So let's focus on how to build our relationships. Okay, how do we more effectively interact with one another in such a way that we don't push each other away? All right, so that's what brings us to the rules of improv. Now, uh, at the start of the day, I wasn't sure how I was gonna do some of this stuff, uh, but I reached out to my buddy, uh, Nathan Nicholson, and my colleague here at the NCEO, and somebody that I've loved having uh, as a partner and friend on staff. Uh, he's, agreed, he's agreed to do some of these exercises that I would normally uh, have you guys do uh, if we were doing this in person. And maybe one day we can do this in person. In fact, I think that some of the things that we do right here, you can do, you can take this and do these exercises in your own workplace, even if it's virtual. I would encourage you to figure out how to do some of this virtually. All you need to do is communicate with one another, okay? So we're gonna get into our first rule of improv. Uh, now, the first rule of improv is absolutely critical. It's, it's non-denial. It's agree, okay? So if you consider what this would look like on a stage, an improv stage, uh, imagine if you sat down and you had a team of people, they're all often ca called an ensemble. You have an ensemble of improv actors on a stage. Uh, imagine if... In any given scenario, uh, one of these people were to uh, start with an idea, but one of their teammates automatically shut them down, okay? Uh, this is why non-denial is so important. If somebody says something on an improv stage and their partner says, if somebody says, uh, I'm holding an apple and somebody else says, no, that's not an apple, that's a gun. Well, the, the scene stops dead in its tracks. It doesn't go anywhere. If anything, it causes confusion. It causes uncertainty, okay, right? So one of the most important uh, principles of improv is that we, we agree, we postpone our judgment, okay? That's not to say that we're going to agree with everything that everyone says. It's just that we need a structured way to postpone judgment so that we don't edit too quickly. It creates a space of safety, all right, to share ideas and input. I'm sure you've seen people in brainstorming sessions uh, where they're throwing as many ideas as they can on a whiteboard. And then only after they've gotten all of the ideas down, do they begin to edit those ideas, okay? That is non-denial. That's creating a space of non-denial where we can get as much as we can, okay? So it's really support and respect for everybody's contribution, right? And this is why, this is why, um, this is why suggestion boxes aren't often effective, okay? Because oftentimes ideas go into some box-like abyss and you don't know whether anybody has denied or agreed or given your idea a chance, right? It's kind of empty, okay? So it's important to, in, as you're with your team or you're trying to ideate with, uh, with a partner, it's important to create a space. Say, you know what? In this space, what we're going to do is we're going to accept every idea first, okay? 
And what that shows is that you support and respect what your partner is creating and contributing to the process. All right. Now, uh, this is this is especially important uh, for improv. But to illustrate this, illustrate what this might look like, uh, or why a yes or no might matter. And uh, we're going to do some exercises now. Before we get into this particular exercise, uh, I'm going to ask Nate. Uh, to help me out for a sec. Now, let's see if we can get his audio. All right. Hey, Dallin. Yes, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> doing this way? Yes, okay. Nate, so first what we're gonna do is we're just gonna illustrate the difference between a yes and a no, right? Yeses can be very, very affirmative and uplifting anytime you see them. You, I mean, if you experience victory, you often, the first thing you say is yes and failure, no, right? So let's, let's just, you know, let's, let's ask ourselves some questions. Um, uh, have you been enjoying the conference so far? Just answer with a yes right now. Yes. Yes, I have to. Uh, I'm very impressed. Um, uh, have you been impressed with a lot of the speakers? I've been so impressed, Alan, especially with yeah. you. Oh, gee, thanks, man. Uh, uh, well, let's answer a no, though. Are you are let, let's let's see how a no goes. Um, uh, Nate, do you miss me? Well, yes, but uh, you know, it's <laughs> not too bad to have a little break from you once in a while. I'm a little a little high strong, high strong man. Okay, so so a yes and a no in any given for any given response can be. Uh, kind of, it, it can set the tone, right? Um, but what we're going to do right now is we're going to we're going to share a little exercise that I like to do um, both at our conferences and with companies. I love doing this exercise with companies uh, because we get every everybody involved. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to show what denial looks like, kind of. Uh, as we try to make a decision. And it's gonna be a very simple decision. And it's just gonna be a, a decision um, uh, that, that everyone tends to make at some, some point in their life, where to go on vacation. Uh, and more often than not, you're going on vacation with others. So it's important that you have some, some sense of kind of where you're going and why you're going there, right? Um, so, Nate, I want you to start. I want you to think of a vacation destination that you've been that you've been kind of longing for um, for a while now. And what we're going to do is we are going uh, we're going to answer one another with a yes, but okay. So we're going to have a conversation, but the only only rule is. So you have to start every response and sentence with the yes, but, okay? So you got to, you have a vacation, vacation destination in mind? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you make that suggestion. Where, where should we go on vacation, Nate? Dallin, you know, when the shelter in place time's over, let's go to the south of France, man. Let's go to Provence. Let's smell some lavender. Let's sip some, some wine. What do you think? Um, Yes, but the south of France, it just, it, it seems, seems so bourgeois, Nate. Oh, that's, I guess so. I, I never thought of myself that way, but yeah. You gotta, you gotta respond with a yes, but man, we're not done. Make your, make your case. Yes, but you know, I thought you were into that kind of stuff, Dallin. You know, I, I know you appreciate a good natural wine. <laughs> you know, we, we could have a really good time together. Brand. Yeah. Yes, but Nate, I've got I've got my favorite natural wine bar right here around the corner. <laughs> yes, but that can't compare to the real thing. I mean, come on, who are you, who are you kidding here? Yes, but Nate, I've already been to France once, and you know, I wasn't a big fan of their food as much as I am their wine. 
Yeah, sure. But even if you don't like it, I'm going to have a good time. I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of the food from that region and I'm trying to, you know, put on some weight here. So <laughs> indulge me and, and just take the chance, man. Come on. Uh, oh, all right. Look, Nate, it sounds, this sounds like something you would have a good time doing even without me. And I think that that's the point, right? Like when, when I'm only responding with a yes, but Nate, what, what kind of, you know, what feelings, and, and if you can, how would you feel if somebody was constantly meeting your suggestions? Type in the chat box. How would you feel if somebody was constantly uh, meeting every one of your suggestions with a yes, but? Uh, it's, it's sort of antagonistic, right? Yes, but it can be helpful to uh, get a different perspective. <laughs> now, did you feel like you were constantly defending your point of view without ever ever you know it's, you're constantly on the defense and essentially in that in that scenario right yes but i kind of enjoy that <laughs> i can tell man you, you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time with this next one maybe okay uh so so consider how that would go and you you can do this exercise um at work just to just to kind of illustrate it doesn't have to be a vacation it could be a restaurant it could be making any sort of decision imagine how this would play out in in the workplace if like let's say you were in crisis mode and you had to come up with solutions fast but all anybody did was uh, sort of kind of edit first they resort to it and it can be very easy for us to to kind of poke holes in people's ideas you feel unheard and overlooked right you, you don't feel like your partner these are good these were uh they were being debbie downers exactly this is probably hard to watch us do this uh so you're being unheard and overlooked that's a good one um denial is not acknowledgement and right now we need acknowledgement especially when people are feeling fear okay that fear needs to be acknowledged we need a yes and, we feel that fear too. Uh, yes and, I'm going to listen. Uh, yes and, I'm going to answer your questions the best that I can, right? So, so in uncertain and fearful times, denial can be, it can only create more fear and uncertainty, right? Uh, you don't feel like you're being listened to. You don't feel acknowledged. And it can be really easy. It can be really easy for you to want to exit from that conversation very quickly, right? Especially when they don't agree with me. I mean, any, and we have a lot of divisiveness uh, these days, right? It can be hard to have conversations when everyone is kind of starting with a yes, but. All right. So Nate, I'm going to bring you back in just a second, because we're going to get to the most important rule of improv. And we've already talked about some of the consequences there. One, did we go on a vacation? I don't think we ended up even going on a vacation. I think you went by yourself, Nate. Or maybe you, maybe you picked a, you know, just a different friend to go with, right? I had a great time by myself. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I picked the right guy for this. All right. So rule number two, uh, this is the most important rule of improv. It's a yes and rule, right? So it's important that you, one, acknowledge what your partner's created, but you can't just leave them hanging. Uh, I'm, holding, I'm holding an apple. Yes, right? You, well, you, if, if you just leave it at yes, it puts all, it puts all the pressure on that, that same person to kind of continually come up with something else, right? And that can create a tremendous amount of burnout in the workplace. So the second, the second uh, rule is the most important rule in, in improv. Um, and you know, the, the leaders of, of Second City uh, right now, uh, the leaders of Second City actually wrote a book on applied improv called Yes And. Uh, I can send that link around a little later. I don't have it with me right now, but that's a great book on the application of improv in the business world. Uh, and it's straight out of Second City. Those guys are masters of improv. So the yes and rule, okay? We're gonna get back to our vacation. And this time, Nate, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna 
come up with a suggestion. All right. And I'm going to, and don't get me wrong. I would never say no to the South of France with you. Just let that be known. You, you are right. And the food isn't that bad. I mean, it's pretty, pretty great in the South of France. I hear I've never been, uh, but I can imagine that this time of year, it's beautiful. Um, but I'm going to pick a different location and I'm going to make this one a little, a little trickier for us. Uh, that seemed like a proper uh, vacation destination. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to have the same conversation. I'm going to suggest a vacation destination and then uh, you're going to respond with a yes and then I'm going to respond with a yes and and so on and so on. Okay, so now the only role is the yes and rule. And this is where we focus on the, the, applica the additive application of improv, trying to create something. And this is where trust comes from. It's that when, uh, when we contribute something, our, everyone else is, we create a structure where everyone else is expected to contribute, right? And even if those ideas are dumb, you just keep it rolling. You keep that ideation efficient. Okay, so we're going to have this conversation. Nate, I, I can't wait for this vacation that we've been planning, man. And uh, I know we haven't picked the destination, but I've always wanted to go uh, to Antarctica. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel about that? Yes, I like it a lot. I like it. the air is going to be so dry. It's going to just blow out my hair in the best possible way. <laughs> yes. I love that idea, dude. Yes, and we'll finally take advantage of those big uh, warm jackets uh, that we, we bought but could never use here in the Bay Area. Yeah, and we can maybe go visit the scientists who are kind of stationed in that lonely outpost. I bet those people have some, some wacky insights into the nature of reality <laughs> from being alone all the time, you know? Yes, and, and while, we're, while we're at it, Man, I think we should uh, uh, take a, a boat ride with those wacky characters uh, so that they can show us some of the best wildlife uh, down near the Antarctic. Yeah, we can see the penguins huddling together in a circle for, for warmth, like I saw on that TV show. Penguins are in this South Pole, right? I'm not, I'm not I, wrong. I want to say they are. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, David Attenborough. But yes, and, you know, Speaking of wine, I hear the wine in Chile is great. Maybe seeing as we got to take a boat ride down from the southern tip of South America, uh, we could hit up Chile as well and, and try some of their natural wines. Okay. Yes. And, you know, I love being on a boat. I love smelling the salt air. We can maybe do some bird watching with, with our binoculars. Yes, and I have an old fishing pole that I'm, that I'm sure would be of zero use in those cold temperatures. Uh, but what the hell, let's try it out. Yes, yeah, so we can make ceviche on the boat. We'll get some lime juice and not get scurvy either. <laughs> okay, see, I actually have more fun. I never get to actually do the, the, the exercise. <laughs> But this is actually, now I know why so many people love doing this. Uh, this, is, this has been a really excellent uh, planning session. I can't wait for this. Guys, what is, what is the difference? What is the difference here? Um, one, the, the thing that I always, I always find whenever somebody does this exercise in, in this session, I always find um, that they somehow end up at going to multiple locations because they run out of things to do wherever they're at and, and it just keeps rolling and they're like well let's go here let's go here and with total disregard for our budget right by the way i hear trips to antarctica are, are extremely expensive um but you know i guess that's why we got to start doing our research so what what is different here y'all uh type in the chat box uh what is different and we're i want to what did you observe Okay, and imagine how you might feel in that scenario. Okay, Nate, you've been an excellent partner, man. And I appreciate you last minute coming through for me. Yes, I'm happy to do it again another time, Dallin. Always a pleasure. All right, buddy. We'll see you later. Everyone right. give, 
everyone give a, a slow clap for Nate's acting. Who, who he was doing some acting, some some uh, uh, role play acting today in in the previous session. Uh, good on you, Nate. So Nate, we're gonna let you go, man, and we're gonna finish up this uh, this session. What what did we feel differently? Um, so go ahead and and type. What is different about this than last time? The additive approach unlocks what is possible okay in the previous approach denial we were only we were only focused on the impossible right why this wouldn't work okay everyone you're only focused on why this is not going to work and i'm sure you've been in an office where there's one person that is strictly focused on why something won't work right that can be inefficient it can take a long time to edit ideas and figure out why something won't won't, won't work so you got to create that structure and space so that people uh, can first say yes and, right? Big difference, the ideas build. They use, they used to coach high school improv team. So fun, right? It can be life-changing, not just in work, but in, in your own life, right? You really build on what other people have to say, right? Um, there's, Stephen Johnson wrote a book, Where Do Good Ideas Come From? Look that book up, Where Do Good Ideas Come From? Talks about the adjacent possible, right? People have to think about big ideas as eureka moments. They're not eureka moments. It's a series of people interacting with one another, right? Thomas Edison would have been Thomas Edison without Nikola Tesla, right? More ideas come from the original thought. You're just con you're constantly going. Your conversation energy. We're both engaged in one another. Sometimes people say during the yes, but. I feel like I got to lean back. I'm like, ugh, your body language changing. Us, we're laughing. We're having a good time with this. And you can have a good time doing this. The energy level is totally different. You are correct, right? Uh, so that's, if you want to create involvement, you have to enable it, okay? And you can't enable it by saying no, creating norms that, that don't affirm, don't build. They just focus on denial, right? So that's what we're trying to do. We're eliminating the fear of a no, knowing that our rule is yes and. And we're just going to see where this goes. Might go nowhere. Like I said, can be expensive. We may not have a budget for it, but maybe one day, right? Uh, you want to support your teammates? Don't exhaust them. Rule number three, make statements. Don't always ask questions. Sometimes questions are necessary, but try to make statements. Try to take the pressure off your teammates. Um, uh, Let's see. Yep. Yes. Yes. But people can be viewed as, as devil ad, advocate too, um, depending on how often this occurs with them. But yes, people can be invigorating and innovative. This is a good point. I like this point big time because I, I often say that if you're going to have a devil's advocate, structure it. Don't leave it to somebody's uh, just, you know, general kind of personality. It's important to structure who the devil advocate is going to be so that everyone knows that they are playing devil's advocate. And again, sometimes you want to create a space where that's the case, but that is a very good point. I really like that one. Uh, there are, there is some room for a devil's advocate, but I encourage you structure it, make sure the group knows who it is. Uh, so make statements, include yourself, focus on solutions, support the team. That's rule number three, make statements, support the don't be too quick to edit, okay? Uh, because too much negativity uh, and risk aversion, it's gonna inhibit growth, it's gonna inhibit willingness to participate. How do you implement yes and if you don't actually agree with, the other, what, with what the other person is saying? Well, that's why the structure is so important. That's why you have to create structure for editing. Uh, it's okay if you don't agree. It's, this is not to say that you, you won't, you will, you need to agree. It's, it's saying that just for this space, if we're running a meeting, if we're taking a huddle and we're trying to brainstorm on something, we can't get too caught up in the disagreements right away. We need to get everything out on the table and then create a space and time for the editing, right? For why something really won't work, all right? Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, and I do like this question um, because it, it, it can be a tricky one, um, especially with something super consequential. Uh, so 
I would say, I would say, remember that high involvement requires structure. Uh, and it's okay to not disagree. We're not here to agree. And this is what psychological safety is all about. Amy Edmondson's research, what she found, she was studying, she was actually studying, and go look, go look up her research again. She was actually studying medical teams, okay? And initially, she wanted to figure out what made a team successful, right? So she thought that if a team made more mistakes, then they were going to be the more unsuccessful team. Now, that's pretty intuitive. But what her research yielded was something very, very interesting. It's not what she expected, her findings. Uh, now, certainly, teams that were making a lot of mistakes were not, were not successful. But then that gets into the question, well, why are they making so many mistakes? And what she found was that the most successful teams actually were the ones that identified the mistakes. Now she wondered why, why were they identifying mistakes, able to identify mistakes, and these guys were just making mistakes. Well, the successful teams created high involvement and psychological safety, right? The medical teams enabled an environment where people under their, you know, somebody uh, that sits in a position less superior than say uh, the lead of their team, their medical team, felt comfortable and safe enough to bring up potential mistakes in their diagnosis or their treatment, right? So they had this environment and there's a really interesting article that came out several years ago about Google's uh, study, own, own effort to figure out what made their teams most more successful. The article is in the New York Times. I can find it and I can post it in our, in our um, a chat lounge later, okay? And I encourage you to look at that article because it also references Amy Edmondson. Google found the same things. They found that their most successful teams had a sense of psychological safety, comfort, an ability to, it's, it's not, you know, it's not about always agreeing, uh, but it's about creating an environment where we feel comfortable agreeing when, or feel comfortable disagreeing when appropriate, right? And, and even though you disagree with me, I mean, we have disagreements all the time. I mean, everyone, this is, you know, we're, we, we operate, you know, as one, we make decisions collectively. Of course, we're gonna get into scenarios. It's inevitable, right? And it's inevitable, uh, it's inevitable for everyone to agree. But the point is, is that everyone is heard. Even if an idea isn't used, just the fact that the idea was considered can often be powerful. The last and one of my favorite is there are no mistakes. Okay, now, of course, there are mistakes. Of course, they're going to be failures. But it's what we do with those failures. They're opportunities. We need to treat them as opportunities. As I said about Thomas Edison, I, he, he has a quote, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Okay, uh, so we need to kind of stop the blame game. We need to make mistakes okay. Mistakes are inevitable. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, uh, Sean Burcham. CEO of PFS Brands. Uh, earlier this week, he said one of their core principles at PFS Brands uh, and, and their sort of grit slogan is tolerance of failure. This is huge, right? We need to, we need to be able to feel comfortable making failures and know that our teammates are going to be more focused on what we learn from those failures than what, those fail, what consequences came of them. Oftentimes, the consequences, if used correctly, can, can end up creating more innovation, more improvements to our processes, right? You need to identify what's wrong with something uh, before you can fix it. So, you know, failure can often be tr treated the same way, right? Uh, so we want to become more resilient when faced with future failures, and we don't want people feeling like, they're playing the game, blame game. 
So when you're thinking about this in the context of your own workplace, uh, sit down with your team and think back on a time where you or your team did experience failure. Uh, but rather than dwell on that, try to extract positive outcomes from that experience. What, what did we do? What, was, what did we do in response to that? Did it change the way we do things? Did it make us more efficient? Right? Uh, so that's, that's, that's something uh, really important. In fact, uh, you know, if you look at the story of the post-it note, the story of the post-it note is a miserable failure. Uh, what what three M what the the two inventors um, Arthur Arthur Fry and Spencer Silver uh, Spencer Silver I believe was trying to make a super strong adhesive and he was failing miserably uh, he he couldn't he couldn't come up with with an adhesive that was super strong instead he got an adhesive uh, that barely stuck to something but what was interesting about this adhesive was that it did, did stick, but when you removed it, it didn't leave any residue on what it stuck to, right? Didn't really quite know how to apply this to anything. So Arthur Fry came along, started playing with the idea. I mean, it took him nearly seven years to create the post-it note, and it wasn't until Arthur Fry put this adhesive in a little bookmark on his hymnal book, because he was in the choir at his church, and he found that the, the paper, it kept the bookmarks up in his book. And he said, well, maybe there's something to it. So they ran tests in Boise where they sent around post-it notes to all the businesses and more than 90% of them said that they would use this. Now what office doesn't have a post-it note? 3M created their best invention from a failure, right? So Remember that, run through those exercises. Remember, you can postpone editing. And even if something doesn't work, it doesn't mean that there's not something to it still, right? So you can still you can try to adapt. And that's what, again, you had two guys bringing their own sort of ideas and working on something uh, to, to make something remarkable happen. Um, so I, we're, we're just about out of time. I want you to uh, fill out your, your surveys, if you would. They're really helpful. Make sure you've got uh, all, all things filled out. And if you've got more questions, let me know in the chat lounge. Uh, go to the chat lounge. Uh, let me know if, if you have any comments or questions on what we've uh, put together here. Uh, hopefully, sometime we can do this in person. It's always more fun to get y'all engaged in some of these exercises. Again, if you'd like to learn more about improv or you just want a funny book to read, uh, props to Tina Fey for for fleshing out some of these uh, and look into improv. If anything, do some. It's really fun and exciting. Uh, and, I've, and I hope that you've enjoyed this session today. Certainly one of my favorite and I look forward to doing it again in person. Again, thank you to everyone that's uh, attended. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we see you all in person soon.